So the time now, eight o'clock. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And a very warm welcome from Maximize Your Time to the CDAC Public Forum 2021, day two. I'm now delighted to hand over to Sangeeta Maiskar, our moderator for today. Welcome back, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We're looking forward to you joining us on a terrific second day and last day of the CDAC Public Forum 2021. And without further ado, let's get on to our first item of the day in which we're going to meet Dr. Agnès Calamar, Secretary General of Amnesty International. And so on day one, we were looking at how things could be changing on the ground on day two, we're going to be looking at the global humanitarian system itself to see how we can restructure ourselves to take advantage of this digital age and increase our accountability to the people that we serve. We had some very interesting discussions yesterday, but before we dive in again, we thought we could go for a perspective from slightly outside the humanitarian system itself with a so-called campfire chat to set the scene. Dr. Agnès Calamar is currently the Secretary General at Amnesty International, who leads the organization's work on human rights. She's a leading advocate for freedom of speech, a feminist and an anti-racism activist. But before this, she was also a leading light in reforming and introducing accountability into humanitarian work of the Humanitarian Accountability Partnership. There, she worked at the very start of maintaining the concept of making humanitarian aid organizations accountable to the people that they serve and not just to the donors. So, with her diverse perspective, we thought it would be good to sit down by the metaphorical campfire and get her reflections. What does she think about the frontiers of communication and accountability in this digital age? Dr. Agnès Calamar, welcome to the CDAC Forum. Thank you very much for having me with you. It's a pleasure. It's our pleasure to host you today. Let me take you to the first thing I wanted to ask you, which is that 20 years ago, you were one of the leaders in developing accountability at HAP. There are many reports that tell us things have changed since then, not least with the arrival of digital technology and communication. Do you think technology really has the potential to shift accountability? In essence, shift the power balance. Well, um, you know, I started um, the work on accountability in a humanitarian setting. So we were looking at mechanisms through which humanitarian agencies could be held accountable, including by the people they serve themselves, or at the very least, strengthening the relationship in a more equal, on a more equal footing. I think your question raises different dimension. It's really looking at accountability more broadly, more globally, including with regard to government. Um, and so my, my, my response to you will be twofold. Yes, on one hand, digital communication has allowed for stronger accountability demands, if only because people have the means to record, uh, to take photos. We have the capacity to be present when we are least expected. And a lot of cases regarding police violence, for instance, police racist violence, um, have been documented and have led to systemic changes because of digital communication. So that's uh, one part of the story. The other part of the story is um, it's not enough. You know, it's not enough to record something for accountability to actually take place. It's not enough for the public to be aware of an incident, for the police to be held to account, for the governments to face um, to face the public in a court of law. Uh, so there are many more steps that need to be taken after the initial mm -hmm. kick 
that we may have initiated thanks to uh, digital communication. And um, I should add, but we will talk about that. Um, even if there is no digital communication, the perpetrators of anything should still be held to account, of course. Uh, we just need to collect more, more evidence. And um, the digital space is a much more complex one than the one I've just described, because it can also be used to ostracize and, um, you know, to, to create division. And is in the humanitarian context, and specifically delivering aid, do you think those in power have noted the shift that you just described? That individuals on the ground, recipients of aid, are able to connect with one another, but also hold them to account. Do you think that they have understood this and are they responding? I, I think um, I think the, the other uh, participant may be better placed to answer that question. But I will say that there is absolutely no doubt that within the humanitarian sector, uh, uh, organizations, large or small, um, that have a great sense of professionalism, ethics, grounded in humanity, grounded in human rights, have taken a large number of steps to ensure that they um, deliver what's needed, that they respond to the demands of the people they are serving, that there are mechanisms through which they can hear, um, the feedback from the people they are serving and that they take actions against their own staff when their own staff are behaving uh, in a way which is in violation of either the principle of the organization or of indeed international or domestic law. So tremendous progresses, tremendous steps have been taken. Is that sufficient? No, we are uh, receiving often enough uh, information about, you know, the, the most typical one is going to be sexual, uh, the the uh, use of uh, of aid in exchange of um, of uh, sexual favors. I mean, it, it's happening uh, far too often. Uh, you know, it, it, it just we just need to keep at it. We just need to learn from every single one of those incidents, and we need to um, to address it. We meaning. All, uh, all actors involved in that. Um, so, you know, your, your question is, um, yeah, I think progresses have taken place. It is not enough. Um, and um, the humanitarian actors are not the only ones, of course, at stake. The, uh, you know, military forces are doing a lot of damage. The international system is not helping when it is becoming impossible for international organizations to deliver aid effectively because of uh, red tape, because of uh, Security Council resolutions that are making impossible for humanitarian organizations to reach uh, the, uh, the population affected, uh, meaning that population affected are uh, victimized twice by those under which they are being, um, uh, you know, uh, under whose power they are, but also by the international system that has not taken into account the fact that, for instance, uh, countering terrorism is very good, but that there must be humanitarian exemption so that humanitarian actors can access the populations that are already victimized by terrorist groups. So I will say, you know, overall, the figures you know, the, the, the pictures is not great. The pictures is not great. Uh, yes, humanitarian agencies have done fantastic things, but the overall context is not good. Uh, Yemen, to give you an example, just one among many, uh, is, uh, you know, stand out as, um, you know, as, as a demonstration of our failures as an international community. It's interesting you mention Yemen, and there are countless other examples of what you're talking about. Uh, as a journalist, one of the things that interests me is the language around the conversation when we are discussing digital communications. And a word that has come up time and time again yesterday uh, is the word transparency. And the other word that came up repeatedly was the word empowerment. And the question becomes, do recipients of aid empower themselves or 
saw is that as humanitarian organizations have traditionally sought to look at this issue through the prism of organizations and organizational leaders giving empowerment to people. Which do you think it is? Uh, it's, it's, I think it is uh, certainly that the, um, the people on the ground need to organize, need to mobilize, and they should do that independently of whether we like it or not. It's their right. It's their right, you know, it's their human rights. They have the right to organize, they have the right to set up committees and to strengthen their voice, including with, uh, in their relationship with humanitarian agencies. The humanitarian actors on the other end have obligations. Some may say that they don't quite have legal obligations in regard to what you're talking about. I happen to believe that they do have legal obligations, including under international law, including vis-a-vis -vis the population they serve. They have human rights obligations as non-state actors, which have the capacity to deliver um, rights. Um, so I will say that it is not about giving. It's about you are under an obligation to act in a certain way vis-a-vis -vis, um, your ethical principle uh, policies that have been set up by most good organizations vis-a-vis -vis the law, international law, international human rights law, and possibly vis-a-vis -vis domestic, domestic law as well. Um, in, in context where domestic law recognize the right uh, of, um, of the recipient, which I will say, for instance, is not the case in a place like Afghanistan, where women and girls are not recognized as truly equal rights holder. So in those circumstances, it is incumbent upon humanitarian organization to refer to international law, to refer to their own principle to ensure equal treatment and non-discrimination in the delivery of aid. So it's not about giving, it's about your obligation. So you beautifully bring me on to my next question. People talk about digital communication as though it's widespread and easy to share, quote, regardless of frontiers, to borrow the title of your book. Is that really the case? Well, uh, first of all, the, the regardless of frontier is a reference to a, a beautiful article in the uh, UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19, which talks about freedom of expression that should be exercised regardless of frontier. That was written in 1948, which means that at that time, those writing that document had a vision of a world where actually we could communicate regardless of frontiers. And yes, I think to a certain extent, internet has brought that to us in a way that no other mechanisms could do because uh, through internet, we are both the users and the producers of information. You know, so there, there is far more democratization in that, uh, in that process. Is that sufficient? Absolutely not. Um, it's, um, a, you know, the, 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 the national frontiers the national borders, the notion of national sovereignty are very present in our system. And there is certainly a clash between those borderless information flows and the fact that government still want to maintain a legal control over their territories, which include the digital territories. So that's one issue. The second is um, the digital divide. Yes, it is there. We should all be able to access it, but the reality is very different. Across the world, I will say about um, uh, half of the people in the developing world do not have access to internet as, you know, as, as they should. And that falls to about, uh, I'll say 18%, according to the latest figures I've seen in the least developed countries. But even in the developed world, access to internet is very stratified, it's racialized, it's gendered, it's class-based. So it, there is inequality in um, the digital access. I think it is probably more democratic than any other forms of communications we have seen in the past. Nevertheless, it is very much uh, unequal in many parts of the world and in many communities. And because it is so ubiquitous, 
internet. The fact that people, let's say, in rural areas or in impoverished areas have limited access to internet means that they can probably not have access to their banking in the same way, that they cannot have um, access to, um, you know, paying their bills, that there is a lot of things, you know, internet has become really part and parcel of many societies around the world. And therefore, access to internet is, in my view, should be seen as a right. People should have the right to access internet because through internet, they can access multitude of avenues for health, for financial um, growth, for economic, for, you know, looking for a job, for all of that. But like all human rights, the enforcement of human rights Absolutely. It's an issue, no? Absolutely, but it is important because it's still being, it's still not being accepted globally that this is a right. There have been progresses made, but a number of governments are reluctant. Why? Because if it is a right, it means that they have the obligation to provide it. If it is a right, it means that when private actors are powering internet but are not powering it in areas where there is no money to be made, then governments should step in because it is a right and that's not happening it's not happening in the uk it's not happening in my country and it's certainly not happening in least developed countries and the importance of hammering the fact there are obligations placed on governments and on the private actors that are making money out of providing access to internet so this is such an interesting idea because it is a very complicated idea in terms of its delivery yesterday we we're discussing briefly the interplay between human rights organizations and the private sector. As you point out, uh, uh, Dr. Agnes, it is the private sector that um, own the means of communication, whether it's social media, whether it's telecoms companies and so on. If digital access became a human right, governments would have to work, presumably, with private companies and trying to get that balance right, which is in effect forcing a private company to um, enact a human right, is a very difficult area. Is it achievable? Yes. No. I mean, you know, it's about um, in your infrastructures. Right? I, I don't think it is that complex, and in fact, it is being um, the relationship between the state and um, social media companies uh, is extremely complex, largely because of content regulation, you know, uh, hate speech, uh, incitement to terrorism and, and, and all of that. We're talking here mostly at this point in time about uh, creating the infrastructure so that people around the world can have access to a fairly uh, good enough internet. And that can absolutely be part of contractual agreement. If you give, if you give access to a market, to a company, uh, you should certainly be in a position to say that market must be accessible by everybody. So don't leave aside a little bit just because there are not enough people there and you can't make enough money. I believe that you should be able as a state to have some kind of bargaining chip with, your, with those companies. And frankly, if this is not the case, if you can't push them to service an area because there is not enough money to be made, you'll have to step in. You know, non-discrimination has nothing to do with the digital space. You will not tolerate that, um, you know, 10% of your population don't have access to electricity because the electrical company don't want to go there. You will provide it to them. Same with healthcare. It, you know, it, it just we just need to keep making that message. Like I said, what what happened to people who did not have access to internet during COVID? During COVID, you know, if there was a moment where the world realized how important digital access is for everything in our life, that was COVID. Let's let's learn from it and let's take all of the lessons we have to take. You, I mean, I find this idea absolutely fascinating. And particularly in countries where you have a five-year election cycle, I can see that it would certainly be a challenge to um, 
the uh, political discourse within certain countries. Um, you mentioned that the context. Can I, can I just say something, Sangita? The alternative is what uh, some co some countries have done. They've made deal with uh, um, with Facebook, and they've told Facebook, um, or Facebook has offered access to internet to countries or to some countries around the world. What does that mean? This access to internet is done only through the Facebook platform. Okay, what the, the implications of that approach is really, really dramatic. We have heard yeah. time and time again about what's happening with, um, you know, with Facebook. Right now, there is a, a, a major whistleblower, and yeah. thank you to you, whistleblower, yeah. that has reported how uh, Facebook is harming uh, people. Um, uh, and as a means to stop that, but he's not doing so for the purpose of uh, money making. And so, harming children specifically. Uh, how yeah. children, pre yeah, exactly. So, you know, um, that is the alternative that is being considered in a couple of co a number of countries. The human rights community, the, 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 the digital community has raised hell around that because you are giving a monopoly of access to internet, the infrastructures of access to internet to a company that is going to use that to increase its monopoly. And we know that that company does not serve the rights and the needs of the people properly. So, you know, the, the only way we can proceed with an access to, to internet that will be uh, free and fair is really through government stepping in and making that part of the infrastructures uh, that they must provide their, their people. Going back to the content uh, of digital communications, how do you view the question that promoting freedom of speech and restricting hate speech are mutually incompatible? Well, I, I don't quite see it that way. Um, uh, you know, and, and the international law doesn't quite see it that way. Of course, Practically, there are difficulties, um, but the, the you know two things. One, freedom of expression is not uh, without its limit and without limit. It's not an absolutist. I don't have an absolutist perspective, and human rights law does not have an absolutist perspective. There are um, there are limitations to freedom of expression, and these are grounded in international law. They are grounded in the notion that if you are using speech to incite violence or discrimination, um, to advocate for violence or discrimination, then the state is in a position to regulate and indeed to stop you from, um, from speaking in that way. So in principle, we should be able to pursue uh, uh, freedom of expression in all its dimension and beauty but place some very clear limitation on, um, on some speeches, which are those that incite violence, discrimination, and hostility. In, in practice, that's one of the, you know, the, the difficulties with internet, where billions of posts and communications occur around the world on a daily basis, the regulation of that particular uh, of that kind of speech becomes extremely difficult. Governments are not in a technical position where they can regulate very well. If they do, it's very blunt. And frankly, we don't, we don't want that. Um, companies are in a, in a position where they can do that and they should do that according to international law. Um, unfortunately, as uh, we have seen time and time again, often enough companies rather uh, are more interested in strengthening uh, the, 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 the you know data and information rather than having um, a monitoring over it and that's what the whistleblower from facebook has pointed out mm -hmm. that's what we found out in places like myanmar where uh, the international um, criminal court as, uh, and uh, the UN has named Facebook in the context of the genocide against the Rohingyas for having failed to prevent uh, incitement to violence against the Rohingyas and the misuse of Facebook by militaries and by a range of uh, very uh, dangerous actors. 
so you know the the the, the principle is there you should not see a contradiction but the the implementation is complex and the the focus on what uh, those companies should do under international human rights law what companies should invest so that they can properly train their staff around the world to monitor posts and to be able to respond to it uh, effectively i mean you know i've i've very for a long time supported them uh, those companies in strengthening self-regulation i'm now fed up with it because i think they have actually misled many of us in in making us believe that they could self-regulate that they wanted to self-regulate i you know the, the last two or three years i've seen time and time again that when there is a choice to be made between profit and rights protection they're going to pick profit so i am quite uh, fed up and uh, uh, and and you know really support any initiative at this moment from users from governments well-meaning governments initiatives based on human rights to ensure that those companies do not use their power and their monopoly just for the purpose of make money dr uh, uh, Agnes calamard honestly i could speak to you for hours and hours and hours about this i think the um regulation or lack thereof of social media companies and other internet companies is really the question of the moment isn't it because they have the turnover that is practically the GDP of a small country. I've already overrun. I'm getting lots of messages telling me that we must wrap up. It has been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. I hope we can do it uh, once again, um, hopefully not too soon. I'm sure that the audience has been fascinated by the points that you've raised and they give us lots of material to carry on talking about uh, through the rest of the conference. Dr. Agnes Kalamar, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. Thank you.